In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet ﷺ in an attempt to learn about him, love him, and better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Go to sirahintensive.com to register and for more information. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Inshallah, continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Nabawiyah, the prophetic biography We've been discussing the sixth year of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's residence in the city of Medina And in the discussion of the sixth year, we've been talking about the second half of the sixth year uh, of Hijrah, and specifically the incident that we've been discussing, or rather the, in, the aftermath of the incident that we've been talking about, is known as the campaign, the battle, or the incident of Banu al-Mustaliq. Now, Banu al-Mustaliq, as we talked about a, a number of times, but just to refresh our memory, this was a campaign that was undertaken by the Prophet ﷺ as a response to the tragedy of Ar-Rajiya. Now the incident or the tragedy of Ar-Rajiya was where um, the leader of a particular tribe had come and recruited about, a, about 10 Sahaba who had requested some, uh, a delegation from the Prophet ﷺ to come to his people, to preach to the people, to educate the people, and all of this was a ruse and it was a trap that he had set. And they ended up killing eight of them, capturing two of them, taking them to Mecca and auctioning them off to the highest bidder to be publicly executed as a gesture of aggression against the Muslims and against the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. So the Prophet, that tribe and that leader who had done basically, who had you know, put together this entire plan, the Prophet ﷺ for two years had put off, you know, dealing with him because of everything that had gone on, the battle of the trench and everything. So now in the sixth year where the Prophet ﷺ found, you know, the opportunity to go and handle this issue, he had gone, it, it was not a very eventful battle, so to speak. The people retreated and eventually surrendered. I believe if we, we went through it, but there was one death on the side of the Muslims, and there were about you know, something like five or six, seven people killed on the, t- on the side of the disbelievers. So very, very minimal. However, as I talked about and I mentioned in the previous week, this incident is very well known for what happens after the battle. On the journey back from the battle, we have a few things that transpire. First and foremost, we talked about how um, on the journey back, uh, we have the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ to Juwayriyah radiallahu ta'ala anha, who was from that same tribe, Banu Mustaliq. And the Prophet ﷺ's marriage to her eventually led to the entire tribe being freed from custody and you know, most of them entering into Islam and eventually all of them becoming Muslim. The second thing that transpired that we talked about as well was the incident of Surah Al-Munafiqoon. Surah number 63, in which Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sulul, they talked, uh, they, basically he was speaking disparagingly about the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims of Medina. And that word, or basically this conversation was overheard by a young Sahabi who brought that news to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ tried to deal with him. Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul lied to the face of the Prophet ﷺ and took oaths and swore by God that none of it was true. The Prophet ﷺ had no choice but to just take his word for it until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the surah of the Qur'an exposing him as a liar. And so that was the second thing that happened at this particular time. 
And we talked about all the effects of that. That basically from that point on forward, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul, aside from the incident that we're going to talk about today, he really became a non-factor as far as Medinan politics were concerned. <clears throat> the third event, the third thing that transpires on the journey back from Banu Mustaliq that we're going to talk about today, that is a profoundly important incident from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, is known as Qissatul Ifq, or Waqi'atul Ifq. And Ifq quite literally refers to slander. This is the issue or the event of the slander of our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Now, one of the lengthiest narrations in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari is Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha's own first person account of basically everything that transpired. Ibn Ishaq also relays that same narration with a few more extra details that he was able to get from some of the other narrations. So I'll basically be kind of going through following along the narration as found in Ibn Ishaq that has been reported and documented by all the major scholars of the seerah. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, that whenever the Prophet ﷺ intended to travel, he would basically um, have kind of like a, like what we would call like a drawing or a drawing of the straws to see which of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ would accompany him on the journey. So she says that we drew straws and it was Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha who basically got the opportunity to travel with the Prophet ﷺ on the journey of Banu Mustaliq. She goes on to explain, she says, however, one little thing was that the way that the wives of the Prophet ﷺ would travel with him, was that they had what's called in Arabic a hodaj, it's almost like a canopy. Okay, so the seat on the back of a camel. So it was more like there was almost like a seat that was constructed. So not like how normally we would sit on the back of an animal with our legs hanging off the sides. That's not how they would sit, so that they would be comfortable, and also for the purpose of their modesty. Um, that basically what they had constructed was like a, a seat that would sit on top of the camel. So kind of like a small platform that they could sit on top of so that they could sit comfortably like we sit on the ground. And it's so almost like a couch if you will. And then there, were, there, were, there was a canopy on top of that seat. So four pegs and then they would have kind of a, a curtain or a cloth that was stretched out from over it and then draped over the sides to provide that sense of privacy. So this is how the mothers of the believers would travel. And she says that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, and we know this from just historical accounts and biographical details about her, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was a very, you know, she wasn't very, very tall. So she wasn't very tall, she was of somewhat shorter stature. And secondly, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was very thin. She was very light, she was very thin. Right, throughout the entirety of her life. So she was in that sense, she had a very small build. And so because of that, she was very, very light. And she says that this had already happened a number of times. So what the procedure was, that whoever was traveling, they would basically go and sit down inside of the canopy. And then whoever the Sahaba were who had the responsibility of basically looking after the transportation of the Prophet ﷺ and the transportation of his wife, they would then come, they would lift up that seat, that canopy, and they would place it on the back of the camel as the camel was sitting. And then they would stand the camel up and they would be on their way. And she says because she was so light and that whole thing was constructed out of wood, so it was heavy. Like think about lifting a couch. A couch is heavy on its own. Now imagine if somebody who's very, very thin, somebody who's like 90 pounds, 100 pounds, right? Is sitting on the couch, right? It's not, it's, it's obviously 100 pounds more, but if the couch itself is very, very heavy, made out of like solid wood, you're not gonna really notice the difference because the couch itself is already so heavy. Especially if there's multiple people lifting it. So she says that this misunderstanding had happened previously. That this was a common thing, that sometimes I wouldn't be in there yet, and they would pick it up in place, and I'd show up, I'd be like, wait, wait, I didn't get in yet. And they said, we're sorry, we didn't even realize you weren't in there. So because she was so, again, like as I mentioned, she had a small build, a small frame, she was very light. So she goes on to say that, 
I was with the Prophet ﷺ, now I'm gonna take us back to the reason why I discussed, you know, the incident of Surah Al-Munafiqoon previously, because it's relevant here. If you recall, and if you weren't able to uh, attend or listen to that particular session, you'll find the recording online. But in the incident of Surah Al-Munafiqoon, we talked about how after this news broke, that this was going on, that you know, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul had spoken so disrespectfully about the Prophet ﷺ. And Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul belonged to the tribe of uh, Al-Khazraj. And another incident kind of happened within that incident. I had talked about it where one of the other Sahaba said that, who said this, whoever said this, bring him to us and we'll handle him. And one of the Sahaba, a true Muslim, from the Khazraj says, you know it was a Khazraji guy. Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul made these comments. You know it was a Khazraji guy. That's why you said that. If it was an Aus guy, one of your relatives, one of your cousins, you never would have said that. Right? Misunderstanding. And they started going back and forth kind of about their tribes. And when the Prophet ﷺ heard about this, he walked out and he reprimanded everyone very severely. مَا بَالُوا دَعْوَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ Why do I hear people talking the way they used to speak before Islam? Tribalism. Where did this come from? He was very upset. And so the Prophet ﷺ realized that when this type of a fitna occurs, when this type of trouble arises, it sparks up, you know, more trouble. It sparks up more trouble. When a leak springs, then it starts causing other problems. Right? When a fire breaks out, then the fire starts to kind of like spread. So the fire is spreading here. And the Prophet ﷺ said, we gotta put this fire out right away. So the Prophet ﷺ implemented a strategy, and the strategy was, in the middle of the night, he told the Sahaba, let's go, we're going, we're moving, we're not staying here. And you don't travel in the middle of the night in the desert. It's dangerous, it's dark, it's difficult. So you don't do that. But the Prophet ﷺ said, I don't care, we're going. And he made everybody get up and go in the middle of the night. And he made them go and go and go and go and go for like 12 hours. From like midnight, they stopped to pray Fajr, he said, keep on walking. And he made them walk till noon. And they were, they were exhausted, brutal. Until the Prophet ﷺ finally at noon, he saw that they were about to start passing out. And he said, stop. And the narration as we had talked about said, the Sahaba, they didn't even have the energy to pitch their tents, they just fell on the ground and passed out. There were people just lying around everywhere, just passed out on the ground. They were so exhausted, so fatigued. And the Prophet ﷺ let them sleep for a few hours, made them wake up, pray dhuhr, walk. And he made them walk till late at night. And he just kept doing that, kept giving them like three, four hour breaks, and made them walk for 12 hours, then walk for 12 hours. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ was doing that to preoccupy them, so that the fitna, the fire would stop spreading. The talk, the gossip would stop. So because they started traveling sporadically, out of the ordinary, not on the schedule that they normally used to travel, because the Prophet ﷺ was very disciplined. They used to operate with a schedule on these journeys. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, expecting that it was the night time, I went to go use the restroom. And actually, she talks about this later in the narration, that they would wait till the night time to use the restroom. Specifically, why? Because obviously there's no like a restroom facility. There's not even like an outhouse or anything. You basically have to go use the restroom like outside. Right? Like, you know, in the bushes or whatever. So, obviously for women folk, for anyone in general, but particularly for women folk, there's a concern of modesty, hijab. Right? So, they used to wait till night time to actually go use the restroom. And that was strategically done so that there would be more privacy. Because it's night time. So she waits till night time, she goes to use the restroom, and, when she's, and she talks about the fact that she had been given a necklace as a gift. She had a necklace as a gift, and when she is on her way back, when she's about halfway back, she says, فَلَمَّا فَرَخْتُ إِنْ سَلَمٍ عُنُقِي It fell off at some point, as I was kind of like fixing my clothes, the necklace fell off. 
ولا أدري I didn't realize فلما رجعت إلى الرحلي ذهبت ألتمسه في عنقي She says about almost when I was back to the camp I started kind of feeling around my neck You know how kind of you check your watch? So she said I felt around my neck and I said My necklace is gone And obviously, you know, you never know Something is valuable and has sentimental value Right, so, and it's night time It's not like we're going to be traveling now So she said, I went back to go look for my necklace. And when I went to go look for my necklace, I kept on looking and looking. It's nighttime, so it's difficult. I finally found it, and when I came back, they, at that time they had already departed. So again, as I had mentioned before, the Sahaba came. They picked up the hodaj, the canopy. They picked it up, placed it on the back of the camel, and Bismillah, they departed. Expecting it's nighttime, she's probably you know, resting in there. And so let's not disturb her. And they just started walking quietly. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was an extremely, well, I'll talk more about this. She was an extremely intelligent, very, very knowledgeable, amazing person. But one of the things about the personality of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha is that she was also known to sometimes, like she didn't speak unnecessarily. That's the thing. If you asked her a mas'ala, she'd, she'd give you the answer. If you asked her about a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, she'd give you the hadith. But she was known to be somebody of great dhikr, great recitation of the Qur'an, a lot of you know, tafakkur, tadabbur. And so she didn't speak like very, very excessively. So people were kind of somewhat used to it that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha sometimes just would not, was not very talkative. She'd be very quiet for extended periods of time. Very intelligent. And so they were used to it, that she doesn't talk. And so they place the animal, and then they, they place the canopy on the animal, and they start walking. She gets back and she says, I saw that the, the ride is gone. Everyone's gone. And she actually says that, وَمَا فِيهِ دَاعٍ وَلَا مُجِيبٌ Like there, I called. Hello, hello, anybody, anybody here? Hello, anybody? And she says, nobody was there. I kind of walked around and yelled in all four different directions, and nobody was there. قَدْ اِنْتَلَقَ People had left. So now... I'll remind you of a little thing, and you know, you might actually have some personal experience with this, but you know, especially for children, they us we usually try to teach our kids that if you are in a big public place or you're somewhere, and you get lost, you get separated, what should you do? Stay where you are. Don't start walking around looking for them because they're walking around looking for you, and before you know, right, you're both like playing cat and mouse without realizing it. So stay where you are. Because they'll come back to that particular point. Right? So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, you know, this is traveling for a battle, a campaign. That was the procedure, that was the rule. If you get left behind, particularly if you don't have mode of transportation, you can't catch up, then you stay where you are because when they realize that you're not with them, somebody will be sent to come back and get you. So she says, فَتَلَفَّفْتُ بِجِلْبَابِي I wrapped myself up completely in my, you know, kind of like cloak that I was wearing outside, like the jilbab, the abaya I, that she was wearing. She said, I wrapped myself completely again in it, because again, it was a very large kind of a robe, and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha herself is very thin. So she said, I wrapped myself up in it completely, and I basically laid down kind of in a, in a corner, you know, because it was the middle of the night, and I said, Whenever they come back to get me, they'll get me. And <clears throat> she says, I was laying there, and Safwan ibn al-Mu'attil al-Sulami. Safwan ibn al-Mu'attil al-Sulami. Now, this is a Sahabi, he is from Mecca. He is a Muhajir, he's from Mecca. She says, after a little while I'd been laying there, he basically comes along. Right? Going in the direction that the army is going in. And Alama Suhaili, who is one of the scholars of the seerah, and one of the original sources of the seerah, he actually mentions that the Prophet ﷺ, his strategy, and this was overall part of the strategy of you know, battles at that particular time, the Askar, the Jaish, the army, but the Prophet ﷺ also affirmed it and implemented it. You would have a Muqaddamatul Jaish, you would have an advance scouting party, that would move ahead of the army, go and scout out the area, try to find a suitable place to settle, to camp out at. And then you would have a mu'akhiratul jaysh. You would have a tail party. 
right? You would have kind of like a group that trailed the army. The Prophet ﷺ himself would travel with the main contingent of the army, but he would travel at the back of that contingent to just make sure everybody was there. But further, there was even a further mu'akhratul jaysh. Alright? And the purpose, it's also referred to as asaqa. Asaqa, which kind of means like the leg. It's the last leg of the army. Right? Like the caboose on a train. So asaqa. And the purpose of the asaqa was, specifically, يَلْتَقِتُ مَا يَسْقُتُ مِنْ ضِيَاعِ الْمُسَافِرِينَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَهُمْ بِهِ The objective of the saqa was anything that somebody might have dropped or lost or forgotten, that it was the job of that person who was following up to basically keep pick up those lost items and articles and bring them and catch up to the army and so that the, they can reclaim their possessions and belongings. So he was appointed in that particular position. You trail the army back. A few, stay a few hours behind the army. So he comes along and he sees Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha wrapped up there, lying down. And he said, when he saw Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, he said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, being the only woman who is traveling with the army, he recognizes that it's her. And so he says, Dha'ina tu Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The wife of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the mother of the believers has been left behind. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. He's very upset. So she says that, he says at that particular time, Ma khalla fakir hamukillah. Oh, Mother Aisha, like, why, how did you get left behind? May Allah have mercy on you, may Allah bless you, but how did you get left behind? And she says, مَا who? She says, I didn't respond. That's how Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha rolls. She doesn't talk. Right? So she says, I didn't respond to him. So he understood that I was upset, tired. So she said, ثُمَّ قَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ الْبَعِيرِ He came and he sat his camel down near me. وَقَالَ irkabi. And he said, please get onto the camel. وَسَأْخَرَ anni," And then he walked away. He put the camel down, he said, this is for your transportation. And he walked away and turned his back, so I could comfortably get onto the animal, you know, properly cover myself, position myself. وَأَخَذَ بِرَأْسِ الْبَعِيرِ And then he came back and he held the rope of the camel. And then he started to walk ahead of the camel, holding the rope, facing the front. And she says, فَانْتَلَقَ سَرِيعًا And he started running. And he made the camel run. Because he wanted to catch up as soon as possible. And she says that because it was the middle of the night, we reached the army around Fajr time. A couple of hours. That's how far behind we were. So we caught up in a couple of hours. And by Fajr time, hatta asbahtu, until the Fajr time we had reached them. And we got there, فَلَطْمَ أَنُّوا طَلَعَ الرَّجُلُوا يَقُودُ بِي So they had just finished praying Fajr. And that's when Safan bin Mu'attal walks in holding the rope and I'm sitting on the camel. And I arrived there and alhamdulillah we were very... I was relieved, the Prophet ﷺ was relieved. Anybody, a de, any decent human being was like, alhamdulillah, it all worked out. But she says, فَقَالَ أَهْلُ الْإِفْكِ مَا قَالُوا Some people started talking. Some people started talking. Now she goes on to say that the rumor started churning. The rumor mill started churning started turning. And we got back to Medina. After getting back to Medina, just the journey itself, I wasn't used to this type of travel, right? And we've talked about it, travel back in those days was very, very harsh. Travel in our times is harsh. People, people fly, stay in a hotel, get in a taxi, go to an airport, fly back, and then they come back and they're like, oh, I'm jet lagged and I'm tired and I'm sick, right? At that time you travel for two, three weeks through the desert, Right? Imagine what the toll, the toll that that takes. Right? And just to give you a little example, the great grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, whose name is Hashim, he passed away while traveling. The father of the Prophet ﷺ, Abdullah, he passed away while traveling. The mother of the Prophet ﷺ, Amina bint Wahab, she passed away while traveling. Right? So that's the effect of traveling at that particular time. It's very, very harsh. Very, extremely harsh. So she says, I got back from this journey. I wasn't accustomed, used to it at all. And so she says, I became very, very sick, very, very ill. 
Now, I was very sick and very ill, and I kind of also, while all this rumor mill was going on, all these rumors were spreading, and all this conversation was happening, and gossip was going on, the word had gotten back to the Prophet ﷺ. But I was still completely clueless, says Aisha radiallahu anha. The Prophet ﷺ had heard about it, somebody had came and told him, but I was completely clueless. So I kind of noticed that the Prophet ﷺ seemed very, very stressed out. He was very stressed. He was very, kind of like, it seemed like he was mentally preoccupied. He felt a little distant. Because he was just so stressed by this. And she says, I was sick and I didn't want to be a further burden on him. Because I had gotten sick to the point where I was like, on bed rest. I was running a fever, you know, all different types of things. And so obviously now for him to have to take care of me, it's just going to be more when he seemed like he was obviously dealing with a lot himself. So I asked him, I said, if, if it's okay, may I go stay with my mother to Maryuduni? My mother can actually kind of nurse me and take care of me. He said that the Prophet ﷺ said, فَتِيكُمْ Like, as you wish, like whatever you'd like to do. Most definitely. And... So I went ahead and I kind of felt like something's off, right? But nevertheless, I went and I stayed with my mother. She says I was sick for about 20 days, 20 days. I went through like a real severe sickness, like a virus or an infection or something. And I went through something for 20 days. She says once I had started to kind of recover, one particular evening, one particular night, again nighttime, right? Because that's when it was most appropriate for a lot of times the women folk to kind of go and use the restroom. So she says, I went to go use the restroom. And I decided to go with um, Ummu Mistah. Now Ummu Mistah, this woman, she is the aunt of Abu Bakr. Aisha's father, Abu Bakr. This is his aunt, his khala. His mother's sister. She's a believer, she's a Muslim. She's a Qurayshiyah, she's a Muhajira, right? So obviously to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she's her great aunt, almost like a grandmother type of figure. So she says, you know, we, I was very close with her. So I said at night time, evening time, I said, you know, I have to use the restroom. So she said, all right, I'll come with you. So we're walking, we're going together, you know, just talking. And as we're walking, she kind of hit her foot, stubbed her toe on something, kind of like hit her foot on a rock. And when she hit her foot on a rock, she kind of tripped and fell forward a little bit. And she said, you know, she got kind of upset and she said, you know, Ta'isa Mistah. Ta'isa Mistah, which basically means, may Mistah be cursed. And Mistah, she's known as Ummu Mistah, Mistah is her son. That was actually his laqab, it was a title that was given to him. But his name was actually Auf, but he was called Mistah and she was called Ummu Mistah. So she curses her own son. Like kind of like, you know, curse him. And she says that I got very upset with her. I said, Bi'sa la amrullahi ma qulti. Like aunt, you're my elder, I respect you. But what you just said, I, that's very bad. How could you say that? Li rajulim min al-muhajireen. I know he's your son. And a mother can say whatever she wants to her son. But still, he's a muhajir. He's a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. He made hijrah, which is a huge sacrifice. وَقَدْ شَهِدَ بَدْرًا He's a Badri. The Sahaba of Badr have a special status amongst the Sahaba. You shouldn't talk like that. Because Ta'isa is almost like saying like, damn him. You know, and, and she says, you shouldn't say that. That's not nice, that's not good. And she looks back at Aisha. Aisha says, she looks back at me and she says, وَمَا بَلَغَكِ الْخَبْرُ يَا بِنْتَ أَبِي بكر. She says, Aisha, bint Abi Bakr, you don't know? Just it, like you don't know? And she says, know what? Mal khabr, what are you talking about? I don't know, know what? What are you talking about? فَأَخْبَرَتْنِي بِالَّذِي كَانَ مِنْ قَوْلِ أَهْلِ الْلِفْكِ This is a haya of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha in the lengthiest narration of Bukhari. The narration I have in front of me from the seerah of Ibn Ishaq is five pages long. Five pages of small Arabic text long. If you translate this level of Arabic into English, it would probably come out to be about minimum of eight pages, maybe ten pages. In such a long narrative, 
where she talks about this, the entirety of this incident from start to finish, not even once does she actually even verbalize, you know, the act that they accused her of. The modesty, the decency of our mother Aisha. Not once does she mention that the act that they were accusing her of. Not even once. She just says, قَوْلُوا أَهْلِ الْإِفْكِ مَا قَالُوا What they said, what the people of slander said. That's it. So she says that, I was so devastated by what she told me, I didn't even want to go use the restroom. Like I forgot about using the restroom while we had left the house. I said, take me home now. And she said, you have to go use the restroom. I said, no, take me home now. And I went home and I started to cry and cry and cry and cry. And she said that I was so devastated and I cried so much. And it was so painful inside that I felt I would die from the pain and the anguish. And the hurt that I felt. Like how hurt and, and you know, betrayed I felt that people would talk like this. And she said, I said to my mother that you knew about this and you didn't tell me anything? And she says, what am I supposed to tell you? Right? She, and she tried to console me. Aisha says, you know, she said people sometimes, whether it be out of jealousy or out of hatred or out of spite, people say bad things about people. What, what am I supposed to, what do you want me to do? So she says, anyways, this continued. In the meantime, the Prophet ﷺ once the, the gossip got way out of hand. The Prophet ﷺ finally said, I have to deal with this head on. And the Prophet ﷺ, he ascended the mimbar. He gathered the people in the masjid. He ascended the mimbar. And he said, Ayyuhan nas, O people, ma balu rijalin yu'dhunani fi ahli. Why would people insult my family? Why would they do that? Why would you do that? You udhunani, like cause me pain. Hurt my feelings. About my loved ones. وَيَقُولُونَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرَ الْحَقِّ And you make up things about them. وَاللَّهِ مَا عَلِمْتُ عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَّا خَيْرًا These are the most amazing people I've ever interacted with. This is the Messenger of Allah and He's saying, these people have my back. I've, I've asked them to do the equivalent of going to the moon and coming back. Look how much I've asked them to sacrifice. And they've been with me every single step of the way. And now you come and you attack them. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, and then the, sorry, excuse me, he goes on to say, وَيَقُولُونَ ذَلِكَ لِرَجُلٍ SubhanAllah. Look at the, look at the honor and the principles of the Prophet ﷺ. While he's standing on that mimbar, obviously defending his wife, he also says, وَيَقُولُونَ ذَلِكَ لِرَجُلٍ And you insult, and you criticize, and you attack the integrity, the honesty, the dignity of a good man. Right? Safan bin Mu'attal. You, 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 you attack his honor. And the Prophet says, so Allahi ma alimtu minhu illa khayran. I've known nothing but good from that man. He believed in Makkah. He endured persecution and torture. He migrated through the desert, looking over his shoulder, fearing for his life. He fought in Badr, stood out there on the day of Badr, ready to be massacred by a thousand. This is a good man, an honorable man, a man who loves Allah and His Messenger. And you just attack him and betray him like that? And the Prophet ﷺ says that, وَمَا يَدْخُلُ بَيْتًا مِنْ بُيُوتِ إِلَّا وَهُوَ مَعِي And he's never ever come into my home, unless I have brought him into my home. He's such a respectful and honorable man, that even when he needs to, like he's bringing something to me, he will leave it outside my door. He'll come and stand outside my house for hours waiting for me to get home. He won't even knock my house, knock my door. No, no, no. He stands and he waits outside for hours if he needs to. But he never would step into my home. And you attacked his honor like this. What's wrong with you people? He was very upset. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha explains that the main perpetrator behind all of this was Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulu. He was the instigator, he was the initiator. And she says there were a few 
good people who got caught up in the mix. And this is a very profound lesson about you know, humanity. That needs to be kind of like, you know, focused on here. It needs to be kind of understood and taken into consideration. That, and that particular lesson that I would like to share here is, that yes, the rumor was instigated, was started by a wretched, wretched individual with nothing but darkness inside of his heart, like Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul. Okay? Allah in the Qur'an said, وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَكَاذِبُونَ Allah called them a liar, God called them a hypocrite, Allah called them a kafir in the Qur'an. Allah did. Okay? So we know he's a bad person, because Allah said so. But, the lesson here is, there were good people, true Muslims, true believers, who got caught up in the mix. They did not instigate or create the rumor, but when you are not alert, when you're not cautious, when you're not on, when you don't have your guard up, then sometimes the situation, the circumstances, the culture, shape on, can get the best of you. Never ever sleep on your own human weaknesses. We're all prone to error. All of us are. All of us are. Some juicy gossip tastes just as good to us as it does to anyone else. It's got that moment of sweetness, that moment that, that's, that short little instant gratification. That's why you have to be so vigilant. That's why you always have to catch yourself. So there were some good Muslims who did not start the rumor. They wouldn't, I wouldn't even necessarily say they spread the rumor. But they kind of talked a little bit about it. They got caught up in it a little bit. The conversations. And there's a few of them, Mistah, the cousin of Abu Bakr. He's a Badri Sahabi, he's a mu'min. But he got caught up in the rumors a little bit. Number two was Hamna bint Jahash. Is this the sister-in-law of the Prophet ﷺ? Zainab bint Jahash, her sister. Who is also a cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. Who is a Qurayshiya, a Muhajira. Mu'mina, Sahabiya, no doubt. But she got caught up in the rumors. And thirdly, is Hassan bin Thabit. The Hassan bin Thabit, the poet. The poet on demand of the Prophet ﷺ. Who defended the honor of the Prophet ﷺ on numerous occasions. Right through his poetry. But unfortunately just got caught up in the conversation. So she says some of these folks, they were kind of talking. But Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, that Zainab, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, whose own sister had gotten involved unfortunately in some of the conversations. She herself, she says she defended my honor. And she, and that's why Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha spoke about her very, very highly. Said she was a remarkable, remarkable person. An honorable, dignified, respectable person. She says that the, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked her, like, you know, what are your thoughts about this entire situation? Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says that, I know nothing but good from Aisha. I can literally not find a single bad thing to say about Aisha. فَلَمْ تَقُلْ لِلَا خَيْرًا She says she's amazing, she's honorable, she's trustworthy, she's you know, knowledgeable and pious and righteous and nice and kind and generous. And like just nothing but praise upon praise upon praise. Right? So that was the feedback of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Not only that, but it goes on to mention that, um, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he called for, he asked Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that what does Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu think about this? He asked uh, Usama radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was the son of Zayd, Right, because they were all like close family members. Usama radiallahu ta'ala an, uh, Usama bin Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he said that, you know, ahluka walam na'lamu minhum illa khayran ya Rasulullah wa hadhal kithbu wal batil ya Rasulullah. He said, this is your family, O Messenger of God. She is your wife. She's amazing. She's just as much as a part of our lives as you are. And this is all lies and this is all false and this is all wrong. He asked Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu also said that, you know, there's nothing wrong that I can tell you. 
But he said, for your own satisfaction, O Messenger of Allah, you're asking me, but of course, I mean, I don't personally interact with Aisha. Why don't you ask someone who personally interacts with Aisha? And that'll give you full confidence. So that was Barira. Radiallahu ta'ala anha. Barira was a slave woman who had been freed by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And she used to, you know, come and help Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha around the house. She was like her maid. She used to come and help her out and things like that. And also to spend time with her. She enjoyed the company of Aisha radiallahu anha. So they called her and they asked her, what do you know? And she says, ma alamu illa khayran. She says, O Messenger of God, Wallahi ma alamu illa khayran. I can only tell you good things about her. And she says, wa ma kuntu a'ibu ala Aisha ta shay'an. I cannot tell you a single bad thing about Aisha illa except for one time. I only have one criticism of Aisha. She says, well, he says what's that criticism? She says, Anni kuntu a'ajinu ajini. I was, you know, um, prepping, you know, uh, I, was, I was prepping some do- flour, and, and basically making some dough in order to be able to bake some bread. So I was, you know, yeah, I, kneading, kneading, that's the word I was thinking of that word. All right, I was kneading dough, you know, in preparation to make some bread. So after I had, I had gotten done kneading the dough, then I had to kind of leave it out to kind of air out a little bit. And so I put it out. And I told, and I had to run around and take care of some other errands, you know, clean something up or run and go get something. So I told Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, فَآمُرُوهَا أَنْ تَحْفَظَهُ I said, please keep an eye on it. And she says that while she was sitting there, keeping an eye on it for me, she dozed off and fell asleep. فَتَأْتِ الشَّاتُ فَتَأْكُلُهُ And one of the goats or the sheep kind of just walking around, you know, in the neighborhood, walked into the house and came and ate all the dough. That's the only bad thing I can tell you about Aisha. That's the only criticism I have of Aisha. If we're being honest here, full disclosure. Right, because she understood the severity of the situation and tells you the honesty, almost to a, a beautiful degree, the, the honesty, the, the simplicity of the clean hearts of these companions. So she says, Ya Rasulullah, if you're asking for any criticism, this is the only one. So the Prophet ﷺ, after consulting and talking to people, she says that the Prophet ﷺ finally came to visit me and my parents. And I was sitting at home and I was crying and I was really upset. And the Prophet ﷺ came and sat down. And he said, listen Aisha, إِنَّهُ قَدْ كَانَ مَا قَدْ بَلَغَكِ مِنْ قَوْلِ النَّاسِ he said that you know what people have been saying. And he says, Fattaqillah, always remember, we are in the presence of Allah. Always be conscious and aware of Allah. وَإِن كُنْتِ قَدْ فَارَقْتِ سُؤًا مِمَّا يَقُولُ نَاسُ فَتُوبِ إِلَى اللَّهِ Even if, I don't think you've done anything, but even if you have done, you had done anything, just reconcile, repent to Allah. Make good with God. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. Allah willingly waits, anticipates the return of his slaves back to him after indiscretion. She says, For wallahi in huwa illa an qala li dalika faqala sadam'i. She says, When the Prophet said that, it's like my eyes they dried up. I've been crying for days. Like my eyes have been shedding tears non-stop. When he said that, my tears, they stopped. وَمَا أُحِسُ مِنْهُ شَيْئًا I stopped crying immediately. And I kind of sat there like very stoic. And I was waiting for my parents to say something, but they didn't say anything. And she says that, I wanted something, but I knew, I thought, I'm too little for this. What I wanted was for Allah to reveal something. For Allah to say something that I was innocent, that I was slandered, that I was wrongly, falsely accused. I wanted Allah to say something, but I was like, who am I? Who am I? That God would speak on my behalf? But she said, deep down in my heart, that's what I wanted. 
and yunazzal Allahu fiya Qur'an and yuqra'u bihi wa yusalla bihi that a verse of the Qur'an would come down and people would read it and people would recite it in their prayers. وَلَكِنِّي But she says that, لَكِنِّي كُنْتُ أَحْقَرَ فِي نَفْسِي وَأَزْغَرَ شَأْنًا Right? That I said, but I'm, I'm, who am I? That the Qur'an would be revealed about me. So, I kind of sat there and when I looked at my parents and they weren't saying anything, I said, Allah to Jibani Rasulullah Wasallam, don't you have anything to say? Y'all are sitting here listening to this, don't you? Come on, something? Right? And she said that they responded, Wallahi ma nadri bi madha nuji, what do you want us to say? It's a husband and a wife, the messenger of God, the mother of the believers. <laughs> what are we supposed to say? Yes, it's Abu Bakr, but he's also like, what am I supposed to say? So she says that I said, "Wallahi ma alamu ahla baytin dakhla alayhim ma dakhla ala ali Abi Bakr fi tilka layam." She says, "I don't think any family has dealt with the tragedy that we are dealing with right now." And she says that when they didn't speak, I basically retreated away, and I sat down in a corner, and I started to cry, and I said, "Wallahi la atubu ila Allahi mimma dakarta abadan." I will make dua to Allah, but I will not ask for forgiveness about what they accused me of doing because I did not do that. Wallahi inni la a'lamu la in akrartu bima yaqulu nas, wallahu ya'lamu anni minhu la bari'a. She says, even if I went ahead and just confessed to you, God knows that I didn't do it. And so she says that Wala in Anna Ankartuma Yakuluna La tu Sadikunani. And she says, and if I sit here and I say I haven't done it, none of these people will believe me. So I'm going to Thummal Tamastu Isma Yaqub. She said, I tried to think of the name of Yaqub alayhi salam. But his name wouldn't come to my head. I was but I was angry, I was furious, I was upset. So I couldn't remember the name of Yaqub alayhi salam. This is, this is a woman who had, this is an individual with photographic memory. This is Aisha radiallahu anha, and she says, I was so beside myself, I couldn't remember the name of Yaqub alayhi salam. So I said, وَلَكِنْ سَأَقُولُ كَمَا قَالَ أَبُو يُوسُفُ I would say like Yusuf's father said, right? Because I was so upset. فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانُ عَلَى مَا تَصِيفُونَ فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ Patience is the right thing. فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ Patience is the beautiful course of action here. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one whose assistance is sought in the face of what these people are doing. In response to what these people are doing. So she says that the Prophet ﷺ did not even leave the home yet. He was basically, he spoke to Abu Bakr and he was just about getting ready to leave. That revelation came upon the Prophet. ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ laid down and put his shawl over his face because of the weight of revelation. And she says that, you know, my father put a pillow under his head. And I was sitting in the corner and I saw all of this. For wallahi ma fazi'atu wa ma baalaytu. She says, I didn't even flinch. Ma fazi'atu wa ma baalaytu. Qad araftu anni bari'a. I didn't even flinch. Now think about this. If somebody was potentially hiding something, covering up, and revelation comes down, then all of a sudden you'd be like, what, 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 what what's, what's going on? Why? Right? A little bit of panic. She says, I didn't even flinch. I didn't even start like getting panicking, breathing harder, nothing. I just sat there very calmly. I said, okay, alhamdulillah, here we go. Because I knew I am bari'a. I haven't done anything wrong. And she says, وَنَّ اللَّهَ غَيْرُ ظَالِمِي And God would never do me wrong. And she says, فَأَمَّا أَبَوَايَ فَوَالَّذِي نَفْسُ عَائِشَ بِيَدِهِ مَا سُرِيَ عَنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ حَتَّى ظَنَنْتُ لَتَخْرُجَنَّا أَنفُسُهُمَا She says that the wahi wasn't done with the Prophet ﷺ, but I looked at my parents, and it looked like they would die before the wahi would end. Like their souls were coming out of their bodies because they were just so terrified that wahi is coming, oh my God, what is going to happen? فَرَقًا مِنَ يَأْتِيَ مِنَ اللَّهِ تَحْقِيقُ مَا قَالَ النَّاسِ They trusted me, they believed in me, but at the same time they were terrified. What's gonna happen? So she says, when the wahi left the Prophet ﷺ, فَجَلَسَ and he sat up, 
was very cold, but there were these like, you know, droplets of sweat, beads of sweat on his forehead that looked like pearls, glistening in the light. And she says that the Prophet he wiped the sweat away from his forehead. And the Prophet said, Abshiri ya Aisha, congratulations, O Aisha. Qad anzal Allahu Azza wa Jalla bara'atik. Bara'atik that God has sent down verses of the Quran declaring your innocence of these accusations. So she said, I said, Alhamdulillah. I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the other narration, she says at that time, my parents told me, go and thank the Prophet ﷺ. And she said, I will thank the one who revealed verses of the Qur'an announcing my innocence. And I went and I prayed to Allah. And I said, Alhamdulillah, and I made dua to Allah. There's a reason why the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked, who do you love the most? And he said, Aisha. There's a reason. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ went out, and he recited the ayat, that had been revealed upon the people. And those who were involved in the accusation, the slander of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, actually received, I know it's a very sensitive topic in our times, in our day and age, about hudud, punishments, and you know, the penal Islamic sharia code, right? But just for everyone's just academic information, of course it's not relevant in our situation at all, it's not applicable here. But just for everyone's academic information, that... One of the hudud, there are only seven hudud that are stipulated within, you know, within the Sharia code, right? And one of them is the had, the punishment of slander. When someone is slandered, accused of fornication, of adultery, and then there is no evidence that is sufficient evidence that is brought, then the, that individual who has slandered someone else, disparaged, tried to attack someone's honor, that person is lashed. 80 times, is beaten, hit 80 times. And so all the individuals that were involved in the accusation against Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha were uh, the had, the punishment of qadhaf, of slander was implemented upon them. And it is at this particular time that the ayat that were revealed, and I'll just share these ayat with you uh, very, very briefly. This will only take a couple of minutes. It's from Surah to nur Surah number 24, ayahs 11 through 26 were revealed at this particular time, declaring the uh, innocence of our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِلِفْكِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ لَا تَحْسَبُوهُ شَرًّا لَكُمْ بَلْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ لِكُلِّ إِمْرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَكْتَسَبَ مِنَ الْإِثْمِ وَالَّذِي تَوَلَّا كِبْرَهُ مِّنْهُمْ لَهُ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Actually, these are longer ayat. So what I'm going to do is, I will go ahead and stop here inshallah, and in the next session, then what we'll do is we'll actually go through these ayat so that we can appreciate them and go through a brief translation and uh, explanation of them so we can understand them and appreciate them now that we are aware of the historical background. I'll rather use the opportunity, the last two minutes here to conclude by saying and by reminding that there's a few lessons and benefits that we should take from this. There's many, many. There's hundreds and thousands of lessons that we can take from this. Right? The books of tafsir, the books of hadith, the books of seerah, the books of the scholars are full of fawaid and benefits that we get from you know, this event and others as well. But I'll just mention a couple of them here in conclusion for us to really think about as we leave here tonight. Number one, this of course tells us about the status, the dignity, the honor of our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And the respect and the love and the um, you know, uh, admiration that we should have for her and for the entirety of the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number one. Number two, we should understand what a serious crime it is to accuse someone, to attack someone's honor, to attack someone's dignity. You know, we have a problem and our, you know, people try to bring up, oh brother, but there's a punishment for zina, you know, it's a very serious... Listen, there's a punishment when there are the prerequisites. It's called al-ahkam al wadiyah There are stipulations, there are prerequisites, conditions to establishing them. There's no khilafah right now, there's no Islamic government right now, there's no qadi, there's no court system, none of that. So these hudud are not applicable at all. 
But make no mistake, as we're going to learn as we go through the ayat, the minimum evidence that is required in order to establish a case of adultery or fornication against someone is that the Qur'an says, and the Prophet ﷺ elaborated, that four individuals should have seen the act being committed and know who the two are. And when the Prophet ﷺ was asked, to what extent should they have seen? Just two people entering a room together? Two people walking into a hotel room together? The Prophet as you know, as blatant as it is, the Prophet said they should have witnessed the actual act of physical penetration. That's, that's very severe. And I know that kind of challenges some of our sensitivities. But that should embed within us a profound amount of respect of how serious these issues are. And these are not accusations to be thrown around lightly. Very serious. And the fuqaha have written, the majority of the fuqaha have actually said that when those witnesses, this is in the hadith, when the four witnesses come, they are interrogated. They are interrogated by the qadi. What exactly did you see? And the fuqaha have even written that if some of them say, or three of them say, that it was in one corner of the room or the house, and the other one says, no, it was in the other room or the other corner, their testimony will not be accepted and all of them will be lashed and punished for slander. Very serious. We don't take this lightly. So that's the second thing we have to be very careful about how lightly, how easily we talk about people. And we slander people. And we have to be very, very cautious and very careful about this. Hold your tongue. Listen, nobody ever got in trouble for not saying something about someone. Nobody ever got in trouble for not saying something about someone. It is what we say about others that will ultimately get us in trouble. You're better off always just not saying anything at all. Wallahu ta'ala a'lamu bis sawab. La adri, la adri. I don't know. Allah knows best. Allah knows best. Allah knows best. May Allah forgive me. May Allah forgive you. May Allah forgive all of us. There's nothing better, nothing safer. That should be our response. Whenever people want to talk. And thirdly and finally, just a note, and particularly for those who maybe have found themselves in a position, in a situation, where maybe they've been wrongly accused. They've been slandered. Their dignity, their honor has been attacked, has been violated. Then they should know that just as Allah, excuse me, that just as Allah intervened, on behalf of our mother Aisha, and defended her honor, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always ultimately defend the honor of those who have been accused. Not only just in the life of the year after, but in the life of this world. The Prophet wasallam says that when a person attacks the honor and the dignity of another person, before that person dies, they will face humiliation in this world. Even if it be within the safety and the sanctity and the comfort of their own homes. Because you figure, if you never go outside, if you never interact with anyone, then how could you be accused of anything? But the Prophet ﷺ says, no, no, no. You attack someone's honor and dignity, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will rain humiliation down upon you, even inside of the comfort and the security of your own home. You won't even have to leave your bed, and you'll be humiliated before noon comes in. So just know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there to defend the mathloom. Those who have been wronged. And if somebody has attacked your honor, then know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on your side. Like our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, turn to Allah in dua, turn to Allah in supplication, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to live the lessons from the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And next week we'll go through the ayat of Surah An-Nur 11 through 26. And inshallah we'll benefit from the Quranic narrative and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book teaches us about this lesson. Wa jazakumullah khairan wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.